I was born in Wilmington, North Carolina on May 8, 1937, but fortunately I've forgotten that kerfuffle. I just repeat what I hear. The best story I've heard of the event was from my enterprising sister Mary, eight years old. She had the gumption to sell tickets, a nickel a throw, to any neighbor who cared for a glimpse of the new pink baby light. That's the tidbit I heard about Wilmington, except that I also acquired a godmother there, a Mary Alfred spelling, don't know, who I don't remember at all and suspect she neglected her duties. I'm told we moved to Greenville, South Carolina when I was maybe two or three or less, and I don't remember that either. But I heard of one scene the neighbors muchly enjoyed watching, a little train-like group going by their houses on the sidewalk. The bits of life forming a strict line consisted of Mary in the head, about a year, uh, about eight years old, followed by myself at two or three, and just behind me always waddled the white duck that was Mary's pet, who nicely stayed in line. Various other scenes from Durham are lodged in my head. My playmates were mostly my next door neighbors, Owen and Robert little boys about my age. A major memory is of being upstairs in their house, specifically in their nursery, where my mother, where their mother sat in a rocking chair nursing their new little baby girl, or maybe boy, who knows now. It was the first time I'd seen a mother nursing a baby and it felt warm and safe in that nursery, playing maybe with blocks on the floor while the new baby was being rocked and cuddled and fed. At my house, I remember tears spurting from my eyes. I was later told straight-out spurts were always the character of my tears that came from me. Of the tears that came from me. But howling on the grass this one afternoon was justified. My parents were driving away to a movie. They were going to see Gone with the Wind, and they wouldn't take me with them. So, screeches were clearly obligatory. I must have known then it was to become the greatest movie of all time, and I was already four years old. But abandonment comes willy-nilly. Is there an age that can escape? In our backyard, we did have a sandbox, but what I remember of the sandbox was a black widow spider under the little triangular corner seat. I saw the marks on the back, and I knew, and somehow my sighting was confirmed and after that, I always check for black little spiders under sandbox seats. My birthdays in Durham I can picture easily because I remember thinking that each birthday, this birthday is exactly like my last birthday. My birthday party has always meant a square children's table, once green, in the backyard with me and three other children, undoubtedly Owen and, and Robert and a little girl, I didn't like because she had pretty curly golden hair and mine was straight and brown. I remember walking up, wailing at my mother, though the wailing came when I was alone with her upstairs by her sewing machine, where I knew she'd always be. I screeched because she'd given me the worst kind of hair she could think of, straight and brown with bangs across my forehead. I could never get over that betrayal of her especially when I caught sight or mention of that golden-headed, proud little show-off girl. <laughs> Once a cousin was visiting from Columbia, Anne Adams, who was several years older even than Mary. I remember that visit so well because Anne Adams came upstairs when I was put to bed and she read me a bedtime story. My parents read to me, but not necessarily at bedtime, so the memory of Anne Adams beside my bed is very strong, though I've undoubtedly forgotten others. Mary, too, was warm and comforting when I was crying. When I was five, we moved to Columbia, and I started kindergarten then. I vaguely remember some kindergarten in Durham, but that one was my great aunt, but this one was my great aunt Lulie Shands, not too far from Trinity Church. The one activity I remember at Lulie's kindergarten was what was that we made butter. It kept us busy all the time, <laughs> and you didn't have to have games and lessons 
thought up for you. You just held a mayonnaise jar fixed up with some kind of homemade churn and a good squishy substance in it and all day you walked around <laughs> churning and maybe some smart child actually came out with bits of pasty stuff you could call butter if you had a good imagination. When I didn't have anybody to play with, I couldn't always count on the neighbors being available. I would bang around and lollygag on my parents' double bed and watch or pester my mother while she sewed at her treadle sewing machine. One of those times I got her to teach me French, since that was that had been her major. C'est le moment crépusculaire, j'admire, assis sur un portail, le reste du jour dans ses clair, la dernière heure du travail. I liked saying those words as a child, though I didn't yet know French. I remember sitting outside on my front steps on Southwood Drive when I was about six and saying the poem. I recently looked the words up. It turns out they're Victor Hugo's. So I, sh so I should have grown up being fluent in French, but it didn't work that way. I took it in high school and college, but remain as far from fluent as ever. Maybe it's more productive just to learn poems in the language you study. L learn poems in the language you study, and then maybe you'll remember a few, a few rhymes, or something of the sort. Right in the section was fairly important in my life. The Capitol and the church and the town theater, where in high school I was sometimes in their young people's plays, and where my friend and cousin Sarah Hardy started out with me in what was called the Little Theater, and she went on to become a Broadway actress. She was always the artist, Sarah. Painter first, an actress the rest of her life one way or another, even on Broadway. Only she died too young. Why is it the most interesting inventive characters who manage to die too young? I remember she won some trip to Mexico when we were in high school. She'd taken maybe $15 for all expenses, like food and such like. But, being Sarah, she spent the entire $15 on a single painting that she liked, and I guess managed to munch a bit of, bit of food from her awestruck fellow the travelers. Such was Sarah. She was the friend and cousin I most admired, but was far too much a, cop, a scaredy cat to copy. And she was apparently a bit annoyed, telling me her mother was always asking her, why can't you be like Rosa? Well, I was only wanting to be, to have the streak of the artist like Sarah. Sarah was also in my class in school, the one who kept things interesting, getting us to all change names when we had a substitute, pulling a foaming on the floor stroke in class <laughs> with the substitute. All the remembered hilarity was Sarah's. All her life, school meant trouble. But then, as an adult and on her own, she read quite widely in most of the greats and loved them, though her best love was Thomas Wolfe's Look, Hom Look Homeward Angel. I think now she partly loved that work because she knew the setting so well, the nearby mountains of North Carolina, which we all loved. I myself looked up to Mary and tried to read what she had loved and to copy the way she acted. Sometimes that wasn't always possible. Like on the telephone. It was the 1940s and she was always on the telephone, lounging across a dresser on her elbow in the, in the upstairs hall. I well remember her repeating over and over to her friends on the phone, more fun, more people killed, more blood spilled all over the street, and me without my spoon. His early attempt to revive my grandfather Shan's private business had long since come to nothing. Though he'd once put on a mammoth display at the state fair that happened every fall in Columbia, conveyors rattling and circling and spinning, my father flying back and forth and mightily attempting to catch the slap, slipping, noisy, breakable crates of bottles rattling, bumbling over a huge conveyor he'd put up, the display became a riotous joke for noisy teenage boys to my father's humiliation. He didn't quite manage the touch of sexy publicity. 
As I see it, the most important thing she did was organize and direct the Christmas Eve pageant, the one church service all persons showed up for, to watch the pageant and sing the Christmas carols. It was always the service I loved most. All Sunday school children had some part in the pageant, even if it were to be a sheep or a donkey <laughs> or a goat. <laughs> but, the, but the great honor, beyond all honors, was to be chosen as Mary and Joseph. And the director, living with our grandmother as she did, always, mm. of course, chose somebody yeah. in our family to be Mary, at, at least. Since Miss Roberta was childless, she, as a member of my grandmother's household, had chosen two of my grandmother's children to be hers. I was always jealous because she had chosen the oldest grandchildren of my grandparents, and they happened to be my sister Mary and my cousin Ben Goss. Mary, of course, was awarded the highest honor to be Mary in the pageant. The rest of us were donkeys and <laughs> sheep. <laughs> stood on a hill. The street was short and curved, so there was hardly any traffic. It was made for children's street games, mostly kick the can. There was a game in the street every evening. Only stupidly, I, at age six, had to come inside for my bath when the street lights came on. And the worst was that while I was still in my bath, I could hear all the fun and the yelling going on in the street. It was in that same tub that I remember what most people these days don't know about. Because it was wartime, everything was scarce. Nylon stockings had become the rage rather than the awful cotton ones. But the war effort, which was a gigantic machine uh, sucking up all it could of all manner of stuff in those years, that war machine needed whatever it was that went into nylon stockings, so nobody much had the money to buy the vastly expensive uh, new nylons. But Americans learned to sneak around things, and no woman could be seen with stark white uncovered legs. Trousers for women hadn't yet been invented when I, where I lived, though maybe in the north, I wouldn't know. So Americans made a battle of what looked like uh, made a bottle of what looked like chocolate milk, and maybe was, but American, women, um, but American women browned their legs with that concoction. It was messy. My mother had to hold her legs over the tub when she rubbed the stuff into her stark white skin and let it drip around the tub and the bathroom. I watched the messy scene. Anyway, Aunt Rose's husband, Betty Clark's father, had always been, as far as I knew, in the South Carolina Insane Asylum in Columbia, called Bull Street, since my grandfather Haywood had found him cutting his wrist in her tub, my grandmother Haywood. All those suicide attempts were happening because of the depression, which seemed to have moved, mowed down quite a swath of my relatives. And Mary Hamilton Craighill, she was my age, called Mary Hammy, second cousin, but raised as almost a sister because of the disappeared men in her family. Mary Hammy lived with her mother Molly and her grandmother Aunt Ella, my grandfather, my grandmother Haywood's sister, because her father had also attempted suicide and was also put away in Bull Street. My friend and cousin Mary Hammy never saw him until, as a teenager, she was at last allowed to visit her father. I think she told me it might have been a little tiny bit awkward that first time of seeing her father. And was it the last? I don't remember. But it's just one incident the slices of depression took out of families. Those that did survive one way or another. Sorry. There is a story of my great-grandmother, Shan, who lived in this house in the dead center of town. During the Civil War, when she needed to sew up the head of a Confederate soldier, I think it was Confederate, she managed it well, but she did so by pulling the horse hair out of the sofa to use for the thread she needed. The only other fact I knew about this great-grandmother, I believe it was, was that she was something of a household artist, 
Maybe that's all you could think to aspire to in the South. Such was the household of my gran Cheyenne grandparents. But when I was maybe in junior high, my loved, gentle grandfather, who took children on the arms of his rocking chair in the living room, died. When he was bedridden, ridden, he asked me to sing him the Lord's Prayer. I was embarrassed and at first refused, but in the end, it did sink in that this mattered, coming from my dying and most loved grandfather, and I agreed. Those persons from the conference sat on the benches on the lakeside. After approaching the lakeside in a long line, each person holding a burning candle and singing this hymn. <coughs> to the nights in the days of old. <coughs> Sorry. Keeping watch on the mountain heights came a vision of Follow, follow, follow the thing, standards of worth, or all the earth. Follow, follow, follow the of the nights in the days of old. I think that's it. That must be it.